Well, happy to have you back with Theofaith, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, a special topic today in the Psalms. You know, one of the um, encouragements I get out of teaching uh, through Theofaith is that I get to um, dive into specific areas of the Bible. So, for example, uh, last year we went through the Minor Prophets, and I really enjoyed digging in deeper. It's not like it's the first time I've been through the Minor Prophets. Not only the first time that I've taught some of the Minor Prophets, but it gives me an opportunity to dig in even deeper and find new gems. Same thing with the Psalms. I'm really enjoying the Psalms. It was hard, to be frank, I think it was hard for me uh, at the beginning to connect a little bit with the emotion and the uh, just the pathos of the Psalms and to try to understand the situation that the psalmist was in. But I'm I'm connecting better and better. Uh, one of the questions I have is, you know, if the Psalms are a um, kind of an example of the prayers of the church that are to guide us and to lead us, the prayers of Israel to inform our ch our prayers in the church today, what do we do with what's called the imprecatory Psalms? So I've been digging into that a little bit. What is a imprecatory psalm? You might be wondering, what the heck is he talking about here in a imprecatory psalm? Let me encourage you to turn to Psalm 35. You can pause the video right now and turn there. But Psalm 35 begins like this. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of the buckler and shield and rise up for my help. Draw also the spear and the battle axe to meet those who pursue me. Who say to my soul, say to my soul, I am your salvation. And the psalm goes on like this. An imprecatory psalm is a psalm where the psalmist is um, asking God to judge the wicked. It's a plea that God will bring disaster on his enemies. That's what an imprecatory psalm is. It's kind of disturbing. Uh, the term was coined by W. Robertson Smith. I don't know if you're interested in that, but in the 1880s, there's about 18 of these psalms in the book of Psalms, but not all psalms are imprecatory. Uh, sometimes they just have an imprecatory element. So there's 40 places in all the Psalms where the psalmist asks God to judge the wicked. We also see these in the major and minor prophets uh, where God is uh, beseeched by the uh, prophet to bring judgment on the wicked. What do we do with these? Are these things that we're supposed to... Uh, uh, follow the example of the psalmist and pray for um, judgment on our enemies. Uh, sometimes these psalms make people uncomfortable. Even Christians can be embarrassed by praying a psalm like, Lord, contend with those who contend with me. Uh, they seem to contradict the law. Leviticus 19, 17, and 18 encourages us to to pray for those and to um, care for the care for our enemies, uh, the wisdom literature tells us that we're to care for our enemies. Jesus' teaching tells us specifically that we're to love our enemies, and the apostle Paul himself taught us to uh, to do good to those who do evil. So it raises the question in my mind anyway, and maybe your mind as well as we go through some of these Psalms, is do, are we to pray for God to physically destroy, to kill, and to punish our enemies, or are we to love them? And is it actually possible to do both? That's really the question that I'm addressing here. Speaking about the uh, embarrassment of uh, imprecatory Psalms, um, I'm reading several articles as well as blog posts about the place of imprecatory psalms. One writer writes uh, the article, that is the article that he wrote for this uh, Churchman magazine that I was reading, was partly prompted by my witnessing a long, embarrassed silence 
among a group of evangelical clergy after we had read together one of the imprecatory psalms at a prayer meeting. The silence reflected the current reluctance to accept such passages for use, either private or public worship. So he's, ask, he's saying, it's, is it embarrassing for us to pray these things? Should we feel weird about praying for the judgment of our enemies? Common objections that I've come across and uh, I've seen in the things I've been reading is that it's sinful. It's just plain sinful to pray like this uh, because it contradicts Scripture. Uh, the church, in the history of the church, has really not ever prayed like this, some contend. <laughs> uh, these psalms, some will say that these psalms are just descriptive. They're telling us what the psalmist felt. We're finding out what the psalmist thought in their own mind. doesn't necessarily mean this is the mind of the Spirit. Or it's contrary to the New Testament commands to love our enemies. So I want to address each of these as we kind of sort out what we're to do with these psalms. So is it sinful to pray like this? We can ask that question right off. Is it sinful? Well, I just read you Psalm 35. David prayed in precatory psalms. Jesus did too, as a matter of fact. If you look at Matthew chapter 23, which I think we'll see it there on the right, uh, Jesus prayed in precatory psalms. Uh, again, David, contend with me, O Lord. Fight against those who fight against me. Jesus addressing the Pharisees. You serpents, you brood of vipers. He's got a bunch of dirty snakes. How will you escape the sentence of hell? He's condemning them. Woe to you, repeated several times in this chapter. These are harsh, harsh statements. But harsh is not the same as sinful. Harsh is not the same as being uh, sinful toward God or sinful toward man. No, what we see, it's not sinful to pray like this. We see Paul, David, and Jesus, and later we see others pray for in themselves. Some, as I said, contend that the church never prayed like this. And um, Miles Coverdale, who was one of the early translators of the Vulgate Bible into English, and I think Miles Coverdale also translated the uh, Greek and Hebrew into English, wrote an imprecatory psalm for the church. That's a historical fact. Like Martin Luther, you know, Martin Luther, uh, whatever you think of him, and uh, there's lots of opinions about Luther. There always are lots of opinions about everything. Uh, but he, he was very straightforward. He was blunt. He wore his emotions on his sleeve. When he was excommunicated by Rome and branded a heretic, and let me remind you, to be excommunicated by Rome and branded a heretic in the early stages of the Reformation meant that there was a death sentence on your head. He prayed, O Christ, my Lord, look down. Let the day of thy judgment break and destroy the devil's nest at Rome. He's asking for judgment to fall on the Vatican. That's what he's asking for there. So, not only is it not sinful to pray like this, we have great examples, but the church has prayed like this. There is a history of this kind of prayer in the church. Before the church age, uh, Jesus pronounced woe and condemnation on the Pharisees, as we saw in Matthew chapter 23. That's before the church age. But then later, during the church age, we see Paul pronounced a curse on those who pervert the gospel. He said he in Galatians 1, 8, and 9, he called for anathema, a condemnation on them. That is condemning them to hell, those who would distort the gospel. And Paul called for judgment on those who have no love for the Lord in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. So from the earliest times of the church, we've seen imprecatory psalms or imprecatory statements made 
in the prayers of the church and in the direction of the church. So to say that the church never prayed like this is as wrong as saying that this is sinful. We have this uh, contention as well. Sometimes you hear this, particularly among people who don't believe in the inerrancy and infallibility of the Bible, that this is descriptive, not prescriptive. This is not the Holy Spirit speaking through David, or this is not the Holy Spirit that's speaking through the other psalmists. But this is just their emotion. They're just flying off the handle. They are out of control. But that's not the case. The church has always seen the Psalms as prescriptive to what we should do. In Ephesians 5.19, for example, Paul alludes to Psalm 33, verses 2 and 3, and then instructs the church to speak in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. In other words, he is looking at that psalm and he's saying, uh, this is not just descriptive of what the uh, people of God used to do, but rather this is telling us how we in the church should apply this. This is giving us guidance on how our prayer meetings, our gathering should be. In Colossians 3.16, Paul told the church to speak to one another with psalms, with psalms. That is, use them in a prescriptive manner, not just descriptive. And we see in Romans, in 2 Timothy, and 1 Peter, Paul alludes to uh, Psalm 28, verse 4. Let me read that for you. Turn there in my Bible. 28, verse 4 says, requite them according to their work and according to the evil of their practices. Requite them according to the deeds of their own hands. In other words, pay them back. Pay them back. So in Romans, in 2 Timothy, and 1 Peter, Paul prays, pay them back. So again, the Psalms are more than just descriptive. They are giving us guidance and direction in our prayer life. We also have these statements that the um, new contrary to the New Testament commands to love our enemies, but I point out um, not only is the command of the New Testament, but we see this thread to love our enemies in the Torah, Exodus 23, 4 and 5, Leviticus 19, 18. Look those up. We see them in the writings later, Proverbs 25, 21 and 22. Let me just turn there as an example. We find get to it in my Bible here. Proverbs 25. <coughs> verse 4. 21, I'm sorry, 25, verse 21. Says if, if your enemy is hungry. Give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. Well, it sounds like we'll be instructed to take care of our enemies. Well, I think the New Testament as a whole shows that God can both love the world, John 3, 16, and at the same time bring judgment upon it. I mean, there's no doubt in John 3.16 that the Lord loves the world. But he is going to bring judgment. In our other teaching, we are going through the book of Revelation where we're going to see the judgment coming on the earth. So I think the real question, uh, bottom line, for us as we look at the fact that uh, these imprecatory psalms and these imprecatory words are said by godly people, uh, they are said throughout church history. They are said um, um, not only in the Old Testament and the New Testament do we have commands to love our enemies. The real question is how we can do both. How can we both honor uh, Scripture and to honor our enemies and to bring judgment, pray for judgment upon them? So a few different ways that this has been approached how to solve, solve this. I call this the not me solution. He says, alluding to one of the Psalms, he says, we don't find David cursing his enemies. 
but his enemies cursing him. And I think if you look at Psalm 109, uh, verses uh, 6 to 20, that long section, I'm not going to read it. It's very clear that it's David cursing his enemies, not his enemies cursing him. So we can't get away with the not me solution. That not me, that this isn't God's people, this is somebody else. The other solution I call not in the spirit. The curses are personal sediments. So I've talked about this already of the psalmist and not those of the spirit. So it's not me. That is that it's uh, not David speaking. It's somebody speaking about David. Not the spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit speaking. It's just these, uh, these writers are just so angry. The other one is the grow up solution. This one is rooted in the idea that uh, uh, the Old Testament is a less developed form of spirituality. The, the Old Testament is uh, kind of the baby food. Really, we get to the New Testament, we have to grow up. And the implication, of course, is that the New Testament tells us that we are to love our enemies. Finally, it's the nothing personal solution. The imprecation, impre, imprecations are against personified evil, not against actual real people. Those real people are just personifying evil. So it's really nothing personal against them. It's just condemning evil. It's nothing personal. And again, uh, we took some more time. If we're going to really dig down into this, I think you'd find as you read the Psalms and as you go through the Psalms with, with me that Oftentimes it is personal. Uh, we love to say that God uh, loves the sinner but hates the sin. But Psalms 5 and Psalm 11, I think, tell us a different story. It is personal. That when uh, sin is judged, uh, it's the person who's going to suffer eternal conscious torment in hell. Finally, some will say, look, at this is a prediction really it's not a prayer it's a it's a prediction or a, pro a prophecy of uh, what will happen it's not a prayer that it has happened or that it's a prayer that it will happen it's just a statement that eventually god is going to judge sin and it's not going to be pretty so it's really mistranslated to say that it's not a prayer but again uh, I think if you read the Psalms and you read the Psalms, if you're able in Hebrew uh, or if you're able to read the Psalms uh, in different translations, it's pretty clear. These are prayers. These are desires of godly people for God to bring judgment on the ungodly. So praying imprecatory prayers are not out of keep, keeping out of Scripture at all. They're in the Bible. We've seen that over and over. Moses asks Yahweh to scatter his enemies in the book of Numbers. Deborah and Barak ask God's judgment uh, that, they, that the, their enemies might die. Jeremiah asks for vengeance on his persecutors. And in fact, God answered him with judgment. We could go on and on. I'll let you just take in this slide. Maybe you want to pause it here and write down some of these verses and go look at them. Again, if I were to teach this in more in depth or, you know, spend a whole uh, class session at a seminary talking about this, we'd look at each of these verses. But I encourage you to do that. So what we want to see is that uh, these are not um, just... I don't know, out of control statements by somebody who's really upset about all the sin that's going on around them. These are the words of the Lord. And there's really, a, first of all, a theological basis. That is, they're rooted in the character of God for these prayers. Number one, we can point out that the Bible's really clear in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that vengeance belongs to God, not to man that God is going to bring vengeance on the earth. All the times that a psalmist asks for vindication, he's asking for vengeance. He's asking for the wicked to be punished. 
and the righteous to be rewarded. That's vengeance. And David, when he prayed, he didn't pray, if you watch closely, didn't pray that he would take vengeance on his enemies, but rather that God would. God would do that. So we've got this really solid theological basis that God brings judgment, that he brings vengeance, and that the psalmist asks God to do that very thing. It's within God's character. We also know that God's righteousness demands that the wicked be judged. It's not an option. God is holy and he cannot tolerate evil. If God doesn't judge injustice and unrighteousness, that means that God himself is unjust if he doesn't let it go, if he lets it go unpunished. No, rather judgment is the definitive proof and the final proof that God balances his love and his judgment. Exodus 34, 6 and 7, God reveals himself as not only a God who forgives, but who God who brings judgment, who brings justice. And it's through justice, through judgment, just judgment, that God balances his love and his justice for people. I'd say also that God's loving kindness, and if you're following along with me in the Psalms, you'll know that loving kindness is a uh, Hebrew translation of a Hebrew word, which doesn't actually have a uh, direct uh, word in, the, in uh, uh, English. We call it loving kindness. But what we're talking about is really committed love. Uh, God's committed love for his people, that committed love of God toward his people, really demands uh, that he intervene on their behalf when they're wronged. And what we see in the Psalms is the psalmist asking God to intervene according to his character, so often according to his loving kindness for his people. It requires that he do that. It requires. Finally, in this theological category, I'll point out that the imprecatory judgments, the imprecatory demands or requests or prayers from God ultimately are to bring him glory. That everything God does is to bring him honor and glory. The same way judgment is going to bring him honor and glory when the righteous are vindicated and the unjust are revealed through God's judgment. So we have some really solid theological reasons for praying like this. <clears throat> Finally, the uh, judgments are to demonstrate the sovereignty of God. So often when we see judgment coming from God in the Bible, it's sudden and decisive and a complete reverse of what was it be expected. That Israel in its weakest is rescued by God. Israel, when it's on its knees, pleading for help, is rescued and the tide turns and they're saved from their enemies. Ultimately, this shows God's sovereignty over his people and over history. I'd encourage you, for example, to uh, read uh, Isaiah chapter 11, how God at first uses the Assyrians to bring judgment to his own people. And then the Assyrians go too far. They go too far in terms of their violence. They go too far in terms of their arrogance. And God reverses it. And he brings judgment on them. He is sovereign. Um, finally, there are, these judgments are to prevent the wicked from being blessed as the righteous are. These are prayers that the wicked be treated according to their just deserts. There's... We'll talk about this in a minute, but there's this uh, uh, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth principle in the judgments of the Bible. And we don't want the uh, wicked to be rewarded and the righteous to go um, punished, but rather bringing, praying for God's judgment and the arrival of that judgment as prevents the wicked from being blessed just as the righteous are. And then to cause the wicked to repent. God has purposes in his judgment. He's, we have purposes in our prayers. Uh, 
the psalmists and those others in the, New, in the Old Testament and the New Testament who pray for the judgment of God's enemies also pray for them to repent, give them the opportunity to return. So we have these uh, theological basis. We also have a covenantal basis, that we have a basis in the prayers of God. And specifically what I have in mind is the Abrahamic covenant. You can find that in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and Genesis 17, Genesis 22 as well. The Abrahamic covenant really in Genesis 12, 3 promises blessing on those who blessed Abraham's offspring and cursing for those who cursed them. In other words, God had made a commitment to Israel that those who cursed them, and the Hebrew word there, for cursing, I think I have a mistype, a typo there, uh, I'll fix that, but the Hebrew word for cursing in Genesis 12.3 uh, means a slight, a uh, disparaging word about his people. And he will curse them is much more severe, it's a different word for curse, that means a severe chastisement. In other words, that God has made a promise that somebody who just uh, causes his people to, who, who just speaks badly about his people, he's going to come down on them like a ton of bricks. He's going to severely chastise them. And so often the prayers of the psalmist are rooted in this blessing of this promise from God. They're basically saying, God, you promised to protect us from disparagement. So bring cursing on our enemies. Lord, they're doing so much worse than just merely disparaging us. Bring cursing on them. So on the basis of the unconditional Abrahamic covenant, we find David has this perfect right as the representative of the nation to pray that God would do what he had promised, that he would respond. And don't forget, David was also king. This is another Davidic or another um, covenant that God made in 2 Samuel 7 to put David on the throne as the representative of the nation. Like what Carl Laney says, he says, the cries for judgment in the imprecatory Psalms are appeals for God to carry out his judgment against those who would curse the nation. Judgment in accordance with the provision of the Abrahamic covenant. It's exactly right that there's a covenantal basis for why God should bring judgment on the people. Also, the Davidic covenant, as I said, makes God, David God's representative on earth. He is what we call the theocentric office holder. So an attack on David is an attack on God. So when he pleads for the destruction of the wicked out of his zeal for God, David is not just expressing some ungodly feeling inside of him. No, he is calling on God to protect the kingdom. He is asking, acting as God's representative on earth to protect the kingdom of God. That's what he's asking for. The king of Israel is God's appointed servant to rule and the identification of David with God is very clear in the Psalms. Again, John Shepherd, who I was re referencing earlier, says as the representative of God to the people, an attack on the king, the theocratic official, differed in no way from an attack on Yahweh. Isn't that interesting? That an attack on David is an attack on God. That's how closely they are associated. When God puts someone in charge, as you know, David recognized for a time Saul was in charge, refused to kill him, even though he had ample opportunity, because he knew that he was God's man, and to attack Saul would have been to attack God until God took him out of the way. So again, the theocratic or the uh, covenantal basis of this is in the, is in the Davidic covenant uh, in Genesis 12, or 2 Samuel uh, seven, as well as the uh, Abrahamic covenant in Rome and Genesis twelve. 
verses 1 through 3. So it should be clear that we have reason and ample reason to be praying these psalms. But we still have the question, well, can we do this in a way that pleases God? Can we do this in a way that both honors God, command to love our enemies, as well as honors the, carries out the example that we see in the Old and New Testament? I think there is. A couple guidelines here, a few. For guideline one, pray with righteous anger. Pray that justice is done. Not, not vengeance with regard to personal matters. So, you know, if your flight's overbooked and you're bumped or someone cut, cuts you off in traffic, that, that is not a good way, reason to pray for God's vengeance to fall on them. No, not regard to personal matters, but rather pray for God's justice to be done. If evil is happening, if the law is not being obeyed, if murderers and adulterers are getting away with murder and adultery, pray that God's justice would be done in their lives, that they would come under such conviction, that they would have their sin exposed. That's biblical and that's consistent with God's desire. That is righteous anger. Also, pray for proportional judgment. I alluded to this earlier. Uh, in the Bible, the punishment fits the crime. I love in uh, Psalm 35, I quoted that earlier. David says his enemies had dug a pit with a hidden net to catch him. A great picture, isn't that, of a, some kind of pit in the jungle or in the forest, and they've dug it out and they put a net in it, and they're just waiting for David to unknowingly step on top of this and fall through and be caught in the net. Well, what does he do? He prays for his enemies to fall into the very net which they hid. That's talionic judgment, it's called. It's proportional judgment. So again, for our prayers, that means don't ask God would destroy a whole nation if there's only some who are unrighteous. Look at our own nation. Are we going to pray that God would destroy the whole nation for aborting millions and millions of babies over decades? Or are we going to pray that God would make that of um, bring judgment on those abortion providers, that He would bring judgment on those who resist the fact the fact in the Bible that says that you are can a person from birth? No, we want to have a proportional judgment. So if we're going to pray, we pray for righteous judgment. We pray for proportional judgment. And we don't pray with vindictiveness. <clears throat> that is, that personal animosity or, <coughs> or vengeance is our motive. <coughs> There's a difference between vindication and vindictiveness. Our passion is to be for justice. Our passion is to be for righteousness. <clears throat> not that we get our way. Not that... Terrible punishment comes on the sinner because we're offended, but that the appro appropriate judgment comes on the sinner because God's offended. That's to pray for vindication, not vindictiveness. So we have to um, <coughs> pray for God's glory, ultimately. I'm going to go back and review these. But the aim that all God is, does in the Bible is ultimately to bring worship to himself. <clears throat> so the outcome of even severe discipline on the unbeliever and on the believer is ultimately that God would be glorified. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we go back to Psalm 35, be our example psalm. After praying that his enemies would be punished in verse 9, says that his soul will rejoice in the Lord. And in verse 18, <clears throat> he says he will give God thanks in the great congregation and praise him among the mighty throng of worshipers. And David is pledging to bring glory to God when his enemies are punished. This is the point, all glory to God. So there's four guidelines. Let me just back up. <clears throat> 
Pray with a righteous anger. Pray that justice is done. Not that your way or that some personal vengeance is satisfied, but pray that God's justice is done. Pray for proportional judgment on God's enemies. Not that God would crush them unless they are crushing God's people, but proportional judgment. Pray without vindictiveness, that is, without personal animosity, without hatred in your heart for the person, but rather that pray that the righteous would be vindicated, that God's right way would be revealed through the judgment of, again, I'll go back to adulterers and um, uh, murderers, since the Bible does so often, adulterers and idolaters, that their adultery and their idolatry would be revealed and that it would be shown for what it is. And finally, pray that God might be glorified through the judgment that he brings on the unrighteous. So that's the good way, I think, to uh, pray these psalms. That's a uh, some guidelines when you come to it. No reason to be um, embarrassed. No reason to be uneasy as some of those evangelical leaders were in the prayer meeting, but you can pray that God would bring judgment on the unjust and that he would be glorified in the process. Hopefully this was useful to you, brothers and sisters. I, I, I pray that uh, you also are with me and digging into the Psalms, learning more about them. I'll have some other uh, videos coming up and uh, just very enlightening. It's enlightening for me and I'm hoping it's... Uh, not only educational for you, but encouraging and in fact edifying that you could use all the Psalms, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. That includes the Psalms and they provide us an example of how to pray in the church age. God bless you.